successful attack, the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Jordanians, even the Syrians, or some Syrians, would be delighted. Um, but as I said, I, it's not something we, uh, we should do, or certainly not soon. By in the back, it's had his hand up from the beginning, right? Can you talk about it? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in hearing you speak on this subject, especially because um, your book, Obligations, and, and your writing on just war, has informed a lot of, um, I'm Israeli, a lot of Israeli thinking, especially among those who conscientiously object to service in the fair place. So I'm, I'm happy to hear you know, that you, like Dershowitz, have always been against the settlements. But also, I find it curious that you, you think that boycotting is such a morally unacceptable stance in this case. And, and the reason I say that is, as, um, first of all, is I agree that boycotting was not part of the Vietnamese or, uh, or Algerian you know, opposition to those wars, which, I don't, which you consider unjust. Um, but it certainly was part of the resistance to the African, South African apartheid state, which um, you, uh, you participated in. And, and for people like you who are so opposed to settlements and so opposed to patently legal confiscations of land, messianic Zionism, there's really, you know, there's really a question of what should be done, right? Because even if you just want to start the clock at 1967, that was already 43 years ago. And very little has changed. So that's, except that you know, huge portions of the West Bank that were not previously settled by Jews are now settled. And that in Israel, we've developed a status quo about those territories being part of Israel that we didn't previously have. So now you have you know, the University of Aliyah, which you can just drive to from Tel Aviv without even ever noticing that you've left what was once the borders of the state of Israel. So after 43 years in common with this, where the, the situation only seems to become more and more intractable, and where the Israeli consensus certainly doesn't seem to be moving towards anything but talk. Is it inappropriate for people who are concerned about this to non-violently ask that they withdraw their financial support from something that seems to them to be completely immoral? Insofar as this is, this is a statement um, of opposition to the occupation, um, and not to the existence of the state of Israel. Um, I think it is. It's an entirely legitimate political position. It's not my position. I think there are other and better ways of, of fighting. And I think you will find that most of your allies don't share what you just said, that you are committed to the existence of the state of Israel. You would, so it's a, this, there are, there's a strategic question of who you work with in opposing the occupation. And are you prepared to work with people whose goal is the destruction of the state? But isn't that question the same for you two sitting at that table, where one of you constantly apparently is accused of being in bed with neocons, but seems very eager to at least explore the bottom of Iran? Whereas, uh, whereas you, you don't appear to, but clearly any sort of coalition revolving around a shared concern, it, it is abundantly clear to me that, that, that the boycott movement is full of um, insane people, mushy-headed liberals without question, who would never exist in, in a country that they support so, so greatly, and just plain anti-Semites and racists. But why, why should that be legitimate, what is legitimate criticism of, of 43 year long. Well, if, if you were contemplating an alliance with neocons or with, um, with, with um, old-fashioned conservatives um, or with, um, I don't know where you stand, if you are a libertarian with social democrats, you are, you are forming alliances within a spectrum of decency. And if you form alliances with anti-Semites and with people who are committed to the elimination of the state of Israel, then you are forming alliances with Indies. And there have to be limits in political life. And, and just for, if I may, just for, uh, as a footnote, <laughs> I, I said, I, I think morally, I, I of course believe that Israel has the right to defend itself, and I think the West and other people should uh, stop the regime doing what it it's very clearly out to do since its inception, since uh, Ayatollah Khomeini wrote about this in the 70s. 
So I think there's a moral obligation to stop the, uh, the destruction of the state of Israel from the Iranian regime and others who wish to do it. And in, in terms of uh, connections to neocons, I was just referring to the fact that people who are defending Israel in this sense, say against the Iranian regime or other foes, um, or speaking to anti-Semitism in a very direct way and, and looking at uh, the, the demonization and the legitimization of Israel by, say, Iran or others, uh, and defending against that or, or speaking out against that, were labeled uh, as neocons and the like. So it's sort of a, you know, in the academy, a uh, pigeonholing or even dehumanization of people who are really engaged in the study of contemporary anti-Semitism. I don't, I'm afraid that I am boringly consistent. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the, the, um, the original principles of uh, just war theory, the, um, the, the structure of just war theory can um, um, be applied usefully um, to uh, um, the, the fight against um, uh, terrorist groups or groups of militants who use uh, civilian cover. Um, that's not entirely new in, um, in political, uh, in military history. In fact, if you think about siege warfare, the besieged army that holds up in a city is using civilian cover. And the besieging army which cuts off food and water to the city is putting civilians at risk. And the issues, of those issues have been discussed for a very, very long time. Uh, the United States in Vietnam had to figure out how to fight against Viet Cong guerrillas who, um, who fired at them from villages in which people were living. And we sometimes responded very badly to those situations, and we have continued to do that um, in Afghanistan. Um, th there is a standard military response when you take fire from a village or a building. Uh, the standard military response is to pull back the infantry and call for the Air Force. Bomb the village, destroy the building. Um, and that that is a way of um, guaranteeing that large numbers of civilians will be killed. Um, and now we, are, we, are, we now encounter fighters who are looking for that result because it strengthens them politically. They use civilian cover not because, well, they use civilian cover, some of them, thinking that you won't attack them because they have civilian cover, and others hoping that you will attack them and kill a lot of civilians because that strengthens their political their political um, voice. Um, so, just war theory uh, has a has a, an answer to those questions, a, a moral answer. It's not precise, and it doesn't it doesn't tell you what to do in an actual battlefield situation. It's designed to 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 shape the sensibility of the soldiers. And the, 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 the argument is um, soldiers must accept risks for themselves in order to reduce the risks they impose on civilians. And they must do that even when the civilians are being used by um, militants or terrorists. Um, now, what degree of risk, how much risk, um, those are impossible questions for a philosopher. They are questions that get answered on the, on the battlefield. Um, but I, I, I think those questions are, um, they are questions that have arisen before in different forms within, in, in the um, arguments about just and unjust wars. 
And I don't think um, I don't think Hezbollah or the Taliban really change the way we should think about those questions. There were three sort of models of liberal democracies that I've noticed. One is um, in places like India, where different religious groups are subject to a different sort of civil code. So Hindus and most on issues like marriage or succession. And um, the second is in places like Israel, where the state clearly associates itself with a certain religion, but people are nonetheless um, have the freedom to practice any religion that they want. And the third is, um, let's say, France, or let's say the US, where the state doesn't associate itself clearly with any religion. And again, people are free to practice what they want. So I was just wondering which one of these three you'd find sort of the most problematic or preferable and why. And I'd also like to just sort of, as a footnote, say that the personal law system in India isn't a source of religious tension. India has enormous religious tension, like any religiously diverse sort of country of that magnitude would, but it, its source isn't, I mean, the personal law system is a very minor aspect of that. By and large, people are very happy with that. So. Um, but I think you may have misdescribed the Israeli case, which um, um, in Israel, family law is in the hands of religious courts. Christian, Muslim, Jewish. Um, there is no civil uh, marriage, for example. Um, so there are there are there are three different sets of um, maybe more since Christianity is a and Druze. Well, that's a problem in Israel, and it's also a question about Israel. Um, the Jews are peculiarly, at one and the same time, a nation, a, a people, and a religious community. We have this double identity, which, um, and, and, and the two identities are entangled, because we didn't have a state for so many years, for 2,000 years, we didn't have a state, and we weren't able to fight out the arguments about how you to separate state and religion. So the, the Jews have this double identity. Um, but the state of Israel should be the expression of the national identity of the Jewish people and not of the religious it should not be, in any sense, a Jewish state religiously. It should be a Jewish state nationally in the same way that Norway is a Norwegian state nationally. Now, I just, let me just use the Norwegian example for a minute. In 1903, Norway seceded from the Swedish Empire. Um, and it seceded because the Norwegians were worried that they were losing their language and their children were losing any sense of the history of Norway. They seceded to preserve Norwegianness, and the Norwegian state is a little engine for the reproduction of Norwegianness. <laughs> that's that's what it is, and no one in the world objects to this. Uh, maybe the lap the laps in Lapland object to it, and maybe. Um, Macedonian immigrants to Norway find it uncomfortable. But by and large, no one objects to it. Now, Israel, in principle, should be a nation state of that sort. And the religion should be, whether, whether, they, are, um, whether they have separate court systems as in India, or whether there is a, a civil system and then only voluntary jurisdictions for the religious communities, which we have here. You know, a Jew can go to a Beth Din, to a Jewish court here, um, if both sides agree, and it's entirely voluntary, it's like arbitration, uh, but, um, but there is no legal recognition of a Jewish court system here. That's, uh, Israel could take either of those forms. It could be like Norway, it could be like India, but it shouldn't be. 
um, a state defined by religion. It shouldn't be at all a state defined by religion. And its founders insisted that it wouldn't be. The founding documents of, of Israel insist on its secularism. I don't, I, I don't think we have to decide uh, um, if, if there is a history of, um, as in India or as in the Ottoman Empire, if there is a history of separate jurisdictions for religious communities with regard to family law. Um, I, I don't think it's um, necessarily wrong. I don't think all countries have to be like the United States. You mentioned the uh, Crusades in the Jihad, or similar in many respects. Uh, we know something about the objectives of the Crusades. What do you think is the objective of the Jihad? Is it just to get us out of Muslim lands? Or is it to create a worldwide caliphate? What do you, why, do you, why do you think they hate us? <laughs> Well, I think there is um, uh, <laughs> there is the um, the hatred that that Bruce Ackerman described, um, which is focused on um, the, uh, the the presence of Western troops on um, on Arab in Arab lands um, in. in Islamic now in Afghanistan and non-Arab in Islamic countries, um, but I, I I suspect that um, there is a mix of motives here. I don't think this. Uh, I don't think jihadism is a absolutely singular ideology. It takes different forms among Shiites and Sunnis, it, and it probably takes different forms um, within both of those uh, religious groupings. Um, there is an ambition uh, which um, Al-Qaeda represents to recreate uh, the caliphate um, over all the lands that were ever Islamic lands. <coughs> um, but I also think there is, in some of these groups, a hatred of infidels and possibly of heretics uh, also, of, um, of Muslims who have moved away from the true faith. I think of myself as theologically tone deaf, so I'm not very good at figuring out the motives of people who, who are driven by one or another version of theology. Uh, we have time for one more question. Edith Shalev. So, uh, most of you is... You can't talk up. Go slow. Most of you yesterday, and one thing that he claimed um, is that, I mean, we all know that Israel was accused of lack of proportionality, uh, lack of proportion to, uh, and a response is not proportional. And uh, what you said before, your, your answer to Michelle, I mean, you, you uh, described the procedure uh, that needs to be done before attacking civilians. So to my knowledge, that was done in the Gaza war. And because I'm a psychologist, uh, the, uh, the concept of proportion, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. How is it measured? I mean, how can you make the proportion uh, um, given the fact that you, you uh, it's not like two people fighting one another, it's like a state against terrorists. So my question is how your theories could be used. I mean, first, what, what is your attitude towards the Goldstone Report? Just interesting <laughs> in general, if you have. Uh, and then uh, how your theories could be used or what arguments uh, could be used out of your theories to uh, analyze the report or to look at it? Um, um, well, uh, I, I, um, I've read only the executive summary, 35 pages of the 600 pages of the uh, Goldstone report. I've also read 
um, uh, Moshe Halbertal's uh, critique of the Goldstone Report in the New Republic, which I thought was very, very persuasive, and which led me to think I didn't have to read <laughs> the whole report, which may not be uh, the right response, but um, I do want to talk about proportionality because it's a very important part of um, current, it, it figures very largely in current debates. And it has been a feature of just war theory pretty much since the, the beginning. Um, I was, in Just and Unjust Wars and in other writings, I've been critical of the doctrine of proportionality because its standard use over time, its historical use, has been to justify too much. Now let me give you an example of, of how it has historically been used, because it's now being used in a very different way. But historically, um, think of World War II. My best examples come from World War II because I grew up reading the newspapers during World War II. Um, uh, um, the Allies are bombing uh, a, a German tank factory, which is located in a working class neighborhood. It, it wasn't put there for civilian cover, that's where it was, that's where factories were built in, uh, in Germany in the 20s and 30s. Um, now, the tank factory is a legitimate military target. Um, Given the aiming devices available in 1943, it was certain that if you aimed at the factory, a significant number of your bombs were going to hit the working class residences around the factory. You could, you could predict with some probability how many civilians would be killed. Um, and the proportionality argument was used to say, look, this factory is, uh, tanks are rolling off the assembly line. These are deadly weapons. They are doing great damage in North Africa or wherever. Um, and so you can justify a very large number of civilian deaths of using the proportionality rule. You can say a thousand civilian deaths is not disproportionate to the value of stopping the tanks that are rolling off this factory. And who can argue with that? Because how do you know I mean, what damage those tanks might do? Um, and that's the way the argument was historically used. And, and people like me felt that, that that argument had to be criticized. And one way of criticizing it was to focus on the question, what are you doing to, to, to minimize the number of deaths. Now, the higher you fly in 1943, the more civilians you're going to kill because your bombs, your aiming will be less accurate. But the more planes will return safely because the anti-aircraft fire will also be less accurate. The lower you fly, the more likely you are to hit the factory and the fewer civilians you will kill and the more of your planes will be shot down. So you have to think about where between the, the, the highest and the lowest possible altitudes, where would you, and, and that's a moral, it's a strategic but also a moral argument. And it's much more serious argument than the proportionality argument because it, it, it challenges the attacking force to think seriously about wh what it can do and what risks it should accept in order to minimize risks to civilians. And that's the way I, I would like to think about um, incidents in, in Lebanon and in, uh, and in Gaza. And to think that way, you have to talk to the soldiers. You have to, you have to, and to the, I mean, to the people on both sides, you have to figure out what the, um, what the actual shape of the battle was like and what the decision, what kinds of decisions soldiers on the ground had to make. Um, and, um, and Goldstone, I think, had no, just he, this, they, they used the new proportionality rule, which is that any number of civilians killed is disproportionate 
to the value of destroying the target. That's the new proportionality rule. It's as bad as the old one. It 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 justifi it, it vert it's it's a functional pacifist rule. It has the effect of making it impossible to attack. Just as the old use of proportionality made it possible to kill far more people than it should have been killed. Well, to Bill Moyers, Goldstone said it was okay to do the targeted assassinations and implied even the drone attacks were okay. So he wasn't entirely a pacifist in his approach. Right, okay. Yeah, targeted killings, if, if, if the target is a legitimate military target, and if there is real precision, seem to me to be uh, justified. Follow up? So, um, one follow okay, up. one follow up. Um, I'm a little new to the study of anti-Semitism, and um, I've, I've heard you express your concern at the number of people among academics and leaders who desire the, destruction, the elimination of the state of Israel. Um, there were protesters yesterday at Justice Goldstone's speech who respectfully put up a banner equating his report with the Dreyfus Affair and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, how would you respond to those protesters? Do you believe that Justice Goldstone was motivated by anti-Semitism? No. No. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I can't speak to his, um, to his motivation. I find, I find it puzzling um, that he accepted the chairmanship of a commission of three or four people, one of whom had already condemned Israel's conduct of the war before the commission had even had a meeting. I find that puzzling, but it's not anti-Semitism. It may be naivete, it may be um, uh, a desire for fame. I, I don't know what, what, what motivates um, people uh, politically. I think if Moshe Habertal's critique is, is right, as I said, I found it persuasive, um, it's just a very bad report. They didn't do, um, they didn't do their work. But you know, I'll just give one example, because it's a glaring example, which Moshe Habertal told to me, but it wasn't in his review. They examined some 30-some 30, 30 incidents in which Israelis were accused of war crimes. They didn't notice that almost all of those incidents related to one unit in one place. They then um, wrote a report that was a general indictment of the whole conduct of the Israeli army without noticing that the, 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 the charges related only to one, to one unit. They didn't recognize that that must mean that all the other units were fighting in a way that nobody could accuse them of, of any crime. Now that's, I don't know how you, um, I don't know how a systematic report based on months of work, could miss something like that. So unfortunately, I know there's a few people who have questions. We, can't, we have to leave the room. So um, first of all, thank you very much. It's a great honor that you were here with us. Thank you. It's a great honor you were here. And also, just a, a, a short announcement. At 7.30 this evening, um, Yuli Edelstein, who is the Minister of Diaspora Affairs of Israel, will be here. And he's speaking on issues of um, de demonization, delegitimization of Israel, and including addressing the Goldstone Report. So it'll be 7.30 in this room. So thank you very much for coming. And Uh, the situation only seems to become more and more intractable, and where the Israeli consensus certainly doesn't seem to be moving towards anything but talk. 
Is it inappropriate for people who are concerned about this to non-violently ask that they withdraw their financial support from something that seems to them to be completely immoral? Insofar as this is this is a statement um, of opposition to the occupation, absolutely, um, and not to the existence of the state of Israel. Um, I think it is. It's an entirely legitimate political position. It's not my position. I think there are other and better ways of, of fighting. And I think you will find that most of your allies don't share what you just said, that you are committed to the existence of the State of Israel. You would, so it's a, this, there are, there's a strategic question of who you work with in a, um, first of all, I agree that boycotting was not part of the Vietnamese or, uh, or Algerian you know, opposition to those wars, which, I don't, which you consider unjust. Um, but it certainly was part of the resistance to the African, South African apartheid state, which um, you, uh, you participated in. And, and for people like you who are so opposed to settlements and so opposed to patently legal confiscations of land, messianic Zionism, there's really there's really a question of what should be done, right? Because even if you just want to start the clock at 1967, that was already 43 years ago. And very little has changed. So that's, except that you know, huge portions of the West Bank that were not previously settled by Jews are now settled. And that in Israel, we've developed a status quo about those territories being part of Israel that we didn't previously have. So now you have you know, the University of Aliyah, which you can just drive to from Tel Aviv without even ever noticing that you've left what was once the borders of the state of Israel. So after 43 years in common with this, where you are a libertarian with social democrats. You are, you are forming alliances within a spectrum of decency. And if you form alliances with anti-Semites and with people who are committed to the elimination of the state of Israel, then you are forming alliances with indecency. And there have to be limits in political life. And, and just for, if I may, just for a, as a footnote, I, I said, I, I think morally, I, I of course believe that Israel has the right to defend itself, and I think the West and other people should uh, stop the regime doing what it is very clearly out to do since its inception, since uh, Ayatollah Khomeini wrote about this in the 70s. So I think there's a moral obligation to stop the, uh, the destruction of the state of Israel from the Iranian regime and others who wish to do it. And in, in terms of uh, connections to neocons, I was just referring to the fact that people who are defending Israel in this sense, say against the Iranian regime or other foes, um, opposing the occupation. And are you prepared to work with people whose goal is the destruction of the state? But isn't that question the same for you two sitting at that table, where one of you constantly apparently is accused of being in bed with neocons, but seems very eager to at least explore the bottom of Iran, whereas, uh, whereas you, you don't appear to. But clearly, any sort of coalition revolving around a shared concern, it, it is abundantly clear to me that, that, that the boycott movement is full of uh, insane people, mushy-headed liberals without question, who would never exist in, in a country that they support so, so greatly, and just plain anti-Semites and racists. But why, why should that be legitimate, what is legitimate criticism? of a 43-year-long... Well, if, if you were contemplating an alliance with neocons or with, um, with, with um, old-fashioned conservatives um, or with, um, I don't know where you stand, if you had a successful attack, the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Jordanians, even the Syrians or some Syrians would be delighted. Um, but as I said, I, it's not something we uh, we should do, or should, certainly not soon. Guy in the back has had his hand up from the beginning, right? Can you talk low? Please speak low. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm very interested in hearing you speak on this subject, especially because. Um, your book, Obligations, and, and your writing on just war has informed a lot of, uh, I'm Israeli, a lot of Israeli thinking, especially among those who conscientiously object to service in the territories. So I'm, 
I'm happy to hear, you know, that you, like Dershowitz, have always been against the settlements. But also, I find it curious that you, you think that boycotting is such a morally unacceptable stance in this case. And, and the reason I say that is, has 